Well, if you remember, we were talking about the hitch on the front of the car and how when you're done, you fold it up and I drive with it right up front. It's not taken apart and you can see it on the right hand side. It's nighttime, about three in the morning and we're in Connecticut heading back to Boston to pick up another truck that's going over to Albany, New York. So I don't really need a bunch of video to explain this part to you, but let's talk about fuel. Now in the old days, fuel was just fuel, and you sort of got along as best you could because the factories would leave no fuel in the vehicle. They'd leave two or three gallons. Sometimes on a heavier truck or a big RV, it wasn't even enough to get you to the first gas station. To put some fuel in it. So when you got to the delivery point, you paid them the same respect that the factory paid you. If you got no fuel to start with, so you're not going to leave any fuel. So what you would do is get that unit. You're traveling down the road and you got, say, 300 miles left to go. So you calculate how much fuel you have left. Hopefully you don't have much in the tank. And then you add just enough to get you there. And then the game was is to leave almost nothing in, come in on fumes to the dealership. And that's the way the game was played. Now, if you were not willing to play the game that way, get ready to lose a bunch of money per week, per day, on fuel because you're going to miscalculate that fuel, and uh, you're going to leave, oh, say, $20, $30 worth of fuel in the tank when you leave the unit. Well, all you got to do is move five units a week, and five times 30, you're talking about a decent amount of money left in the tank. Some of your big tanks, now most, most places have one tank. Big tractor trailers, the tractors, a lot of them have California tanks, they're 150 to 175 gallons a piece, and you don't know which tank has the gauge. And if you don't know what tank has the gauge on it to tell you how much is in it, you're putting fuel in a tank that has no gauge, and you can dump $100 worth of fuel in there and never even move the fuel gauge off from empty. So number one, you have to know which tank has the fuel gauge in it, and when I get near a big truck, I'll show you how to tell. It's just a matter of knowing where the wiring is that's coming off the tank and what it means. And that will tell you which tank you're putting fuel into. And you can, on these big trucks, lose a lot of fuel because you never, ever, ever want to run a diesel out of fuel. You will play hell trying to get it started again because uh, it's a pressurized system and you lose the pressure and have air bubbles in the fuel line and even if it starts it isn't going to run only to about half capacity real pain in the butt so especially on a diesel you never want to run out of fuel so you would nowadays now since the customer complains the customer has to uh, restart the vehicles it just turned into a nightmare. Pretty much the rule of thumb right now is a quarter of a tank. So you get the vehicle with a quarter of a tank of fuel in it. Now, I'm working for three different companies. Two of the companies, one of the companies doesn't give a dag gum about the driver. So if it's under a quarter, they don't care. You can complain all you want. You're, you know, they're going to say, oh, send me the receipt. Uh, send me a statement that says it was underneath, send me pictures of the fuel gauge. doesn't matter what you do, you can send your mother-in-law. They're never going to repay you for that fuel. So, consequently, you're out of the money for the fuel. You have to leave it with a quarter of a tank, but you didn't get it with a quarter of a tank. If you leave it with less than a quarter of a tank, normally all three companies fine you $40 per unit that you're under a quarter, and I mean a hair under a quarter. One story real quick about fuel. 
I get into uh, New Jersey, and New Jersey might not be one of my favorite states, but anyway, I get into New Jersey, and um, I'm just a very slight, tiny hair underneath a quarter. So I tell the guy, listen, let me leave you $20. I think I owe you a couple of gallons of fuel. And he says, we never checked that anyway. Don't worry about it. So I'm in a hurry. It's a bad neighborhood. I go with it. And uh, about two days later, I find a, a $40 fine for that truck. That guy turned right around and turned my butt in for uh, having short on fuel. So don't get caught in that trap. Now, what I do is when the vehicle, when you're coming up to, say, 150 miles left before delivery, and the fuel, I wait till the fuel tank gets down to one quarter, is where I have to leave it. Then I estimate how much fuel it's going to take, and I use the estimate low, so that if you, it's a big, heavy truck, I use the estimate that it's getting 10 to 7 miles of the gallon and then do the calculation. But realistically, that truck's not going to get over 5 miles a gallon. On an RV, they're going to get about 10 miles of the gallon, best at best with a gasoline. Um, so I estimate 15 miles a gallon so that I'm just a little bit shy of a quarter when I get there. Then when I get there, I top it off to just over a quarter so I don't get fined and I don't waste any fuel. If you miscalculate your fuel in any way, trust me, you can be throwing away anywhere from 80 to three or four hundred dollars a week in fuel. And if you're not willing to play this fuel game, you might as well go back to McDonald's and just go back to flipping hamburgers. It's a lot more affordable and it's a lot safer on your wallet. Yeah, one important lesson that you should always never break this lesson is I just stopped in for fuel and this uh, I was going to check the oil, and as I am lifting, going to lift the hood, this drunk in front of me decides to start the vehicle. Well, you never step in between two running vehicles. I don't care if they're hooked together or not hooked together, but never, ever step in between them. Just as uh, this drunk starts the vehicle in front of me, there's somebody different now. But just as they start it, I'm opening the hood and I'm between the two of us. He starts the vehicle. Uh, I get nervous, step out, and he puts this thing in reverse and backs right into my hitch. It would have taken me off at the legs. So uh, scare the crap right out of you. But just so you remember, never step in between two running vehicles. Never know what's going to happen. Oh, well, this, uh, this session is going to jump around a lot because I'm just trying to tell you as I think of things. I, chain, I use uh, Mobile One Full Synthetic and I change the oil every 20 to 25,000 miles and the filter every 10,000 miles. Because it's full synthetic, it doesn't break down. It does go through the motor like a sieve if you have a leak somewhere, so you have to keep control of the leaks, any leaking of the motor. But on a full synthetic, there's not a breakdown, it's just a matter of keeping that filter clean. I've heard people that change it every 50,000 and change the filter every 10,000 miles, but I don't push it that far. And I've run cars up to 600,000 miles with no major wear problems. Also interesting story about uh, truck stops. Now we're coming into a truck stop right now, but I'm not hooked to a truck. But if I were to come into a truck stop and I'm gonna get fuel, I'll show you. As I pull up to the truck in front of me, 
I will take and go slightly to the left so that I can see his driver mirror. Okay, I'll show you. So that I can see his mirror and I'll leave my parking lights on. <clears throat> and here's the reason for that. I am in Des Moines, Iowa, getting fuel one night. I pull in with a rig, a truck, small truck, and a, a small boom truck with my car hooked to the back end. I look behind me and the uh, daggum lights had come unplugged or were not working. So I pull in behind the truck in front of me, go back and the thing is plugged in except there's no power. So I look at the car, the car seems all right, I look at the truck, and there's a broken wire underneath the, uh, underneath the bumper. So I grab my wire cutters and some tape, crawl underneath the truck because the guy in front of me is fueling and I have plenty of time. Um, I crawl underneath the truck and start cutting the wires and splicing and taping. About that time, the truck starts rolling backwards and I guess I realized I left the damn thing in neutral or didn't set the parking brake or something, but I'm underneath the truck and it's still steadily coming back. Well, all of a sudden I realized that the rear duels are skidding across the parking lot and the truck is sliding all by itself. Well, I grab onto the bumper and it slides me about five foot backwards across the parking lot. And man, I didn't know which end was up. Finally it stops, I crawl out and I look and this idiot in front of me looked behind me looked behind himself and did not see my truck behind him because it's a long rig and I wasn't parked to the left of the truck. I was parked in the center and he couldn't see there was a truck back there, although I had to turn my lights off too, to work on the wiring. And he backed up out of the fuel bay. Nobody ever backs up out of the fuel bay. Now, if I hadn't grabbed the bumper, I probably would have been run over by the duels instead of being dragged across the parking lot. So, as a rule of thumb, park to the left of the vehicle so you can see that driver mirror and leave your lights on to make sure he knows you're back there. I know that you'd never think that this would expect it to be done, but I've been bumped into twice. This one cost me $1,200 in damage, and this guy paid for it in cash out of his com data for the front bumper on this truck. Uh, that isn't going to happen to you very often that you'd be that lucky. So anyway, sorry for jumping around and for the poor picture quality, but I just thought I'd add this to it while I was thinking of it. Uh, more film at 11.